So uh, I'm presenting above the clouds and investigating uh, an investigation of systems from 32,000 feet. Uh, I decided to undertake this investigation while I was on a plane ride, so the title seems appropriate. I was uh, deploying a um, cloud-based system over that crappy airplane Wi-Fi. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, distributed systems and visualization. This is me. Uh, this is going to be me through the whole presentation. Uh, I work for Basho. I am a software engineer. I uh, work mostly in Ruby, Erlang, and JavaScript. So distributed systems. Uh, so uh, with Basho, so we've got this, this uh, database called React. That's our primary product. And it's uh, essentially distributed key value uh, store. So distributed systems have a different set of concerns than centralized applications. And here I'm, I'm talking about um, things that are cloudy, uh, that where you don't know where a piece of data exactly lives. Maybe you don't know exact, exactly where a computation is taking place. It's just somewhere on a distributed network. My motivations for this investigation cover three of them, the fascination, the opportunity, and the problem. So the fascination. For me, the fascination with um, visually studying distributed systems comes from a moment that I had when I was considering the, the solar system. And I, I am going to have to pace for this, so I'll just hold the, the microphone. So this is, um, some of you might remember this. This is a screen grab from the uh, intro to Star Trek The Next Generation, where they swoop by the planets. It's really cool. So, demonstration. This is the sun, okay? It's hot. It's like 10,000. <laughs> okay, some of you are basement coders, so I should tell you this isn't actually the real sun. But let's, let's pretend. Is it an instance of the sun? Close, close. So, this is, let's pretend that this is a scale model of the sun. So, at six, six inches in diameter, where's Earth? It's up in uh, Kobe's row. There's an empty seat with a glass. Okay, so if this is the sun, Earth is back there. How big is Earth? Next to the glass is an empty plastic bag, an almost empty plastic bag. In there is a very, very small piece of blue plastic. Yeah, so you, right now all of you have, have particles of dust on you bigger than the Earth to scale uh, uh, to the sun here. So I encourage you, um, you know, at, during the, the question period to go over there and look at the Earth, and I'll leave this up here, look at the sun, and think about the scale and the vast distance between the two, and just how complicated that system is, that tenuous grasp of gravity, thread of gravity, keeping that, um, that dust particle of Earth spinning in the right place. I mean, really, the, the planning that must have gone into making the solar system is amazing. Um, okay. It was an agile job. They, they did it in one week iteration. Um, but the, the, the point is that visually seeing this kind of scale gives you, or gave me anyway, a, complete, a fundamentally different uh, concept of the solar system and our place in it than reading the numbers. So compare the mental activity that you undertake imagining that this is the sun and that that uh, particle of dust over there is the earth compared to the actual numbers. Right? It's the same data. It's the same information. There's the scale. But visually seeing it, this um, distributed uh, the system distributed around the, the, the sun, it's called a solar system. Visually seeing it, viscerally experiencing it, is much different. There's some other kind of knowledge that you get from seeing the system visually. Okay, so that's my fascination with, with uh, this investigation. Second one is the opportunity. So a couple of years ago, I had a, a Rails app. I was managing a Rails app. Um, it was a typical uh, 
uh, rail setup. So we had Apache, uh, four mongrels behind that, and uh, there was a Postgres database. Um, it's not a Ruby conference unless somebody talks about um, Zed, so normally this is where I would thank him for writing mongrel, but he was mentioned yesterday, so I'll skip that slide. <laughs> so we, uh, we would hit uh, traffic spikes that would slow the application down. Common problem, this was a typical Rails app from a couple years ago. So the hosting service that we were on, we had six servers, one for Apache, four for mongrels, and uh, one for Postgres. And they looked at our uh, usage and our log files and they said, well, you need more mongrels. And it's a really good uh, hosting company. I don't think there's anything wrong with this assessment. I think it was the right conclusion to come to. Uh, however, they um, make money off of uh, hosting instances by basically on, on RAM, the amount of RAM that you use in, per instance. Mongrels take a lot of RAM. So it was gonna be really expensive to double the number of mongrels that we had. So before we did that, before we put that money down, I decided it would be useful to, um, <laughs> well, to take out a, a different kind of expense, I guess, my time, and investigate the system a little bit more. So to do that, uh, I kind of dove into operational research, and I wanted to simulate this system. So in, 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 in a Q research or anything like that, uh, you can look at all of, any of the parts here as basically having two things, a Q coming in, and uh, that happens on some sort of rate, and then some service that the, that the node does, and that takes a certain amount of time. So Apache has requests come in at some particular rate, and it performs some action and then sends the request on a mongrel. Same with an individual mongrel. It has stuff come in, requests come in from Apache at some given rate. It takes a certain amount of time to, to service the request and then does something else with it. So of course there's a lot of tools out there to um, commercially simulate a system like this. I found most of them cumbersome and I'm a Ruby developer so I wrote my own. Uh, it's called DSQ, stands for Darn Simple Queuing. I'm not really gonna talk about DSQ too much, so I'm just gonna show you that like, it is indeed simple. So you require DSQ, it's a DSL within Ruby. Uh, in this case, you can create a new simulation. Um, it only has one node, so it has an arrival rate that's distributed along some exponential curve. Uh, a service rate, so the time it takes a server request is distributed uh, uh, along some exponential curve. And then it'll run that for a default of uh, uh, 60 units of time and print a report. A report might look something like this. Uh, again, numbers. So you can see that initially there was nothing in the queue. Uh, when I stopped it, there was four things in the queue, about a thousand things went through it, and there's other numbers. So you can use this to, to get an idea of, well, I used it to solve this problem. Um, but you can use this to simulate uh, an event or things going through a system, possibly a distributed system, but it's not, it's hard to visualize it. There are some products on the market that will 3D render this kind of thing. Um, I don't find them particularly useful because I think that the, the 3D rendering tends to be cartoony. Uh, so it's hard, to, it's hard to visualize this. In the end, what it turned out was the uh, traffic pattern, the variability in timing between incoming requests was actually causing Postgres to uh, cough. So adding more mongrels would not have helped. And looking at the problem again, looking at the data peripherally, there's, there's really no way to know this. You, you had to either do it and find out that you were wrong and didn't solve the problem, or you had to simulate it. And in that case, in this case we did, we simulated it, and we found that just increasing the, the, the uh, CPU and RAM for Postgres, a much less expensive endeavor, uh, enabled the application to handle uh, the same uh, kinds of traffic spikes. Okay, so the opportunity. Well, money's a big one. Uh, you know, we've got things like OpenFlow coming up and um, 
cloud technologies in general, but particularly when you look at things like uh, network, where you can ad hoc increase the capacity for uh, some part of your application or service, and uh, soon ad hoc um, throttle the bandwidth for a different uh, service. Being able to visualize this and fundamentally understand this, if you're able to do that, if you have tools to do that, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. Uh, saving your time, your frustration, all of which ultimately um, translates into this. So my third motivation for this investigation is the, the, the problem is a challenging one. So simulating systems is hard. I wrote DSQ because I thought I could make it easier, but it's still uh, difficult to uh, collect the data and um, set up a correct model and run them and understand what, you, what you've ran. So if simulating systems is hard, then simulating distributed systems is probably distributedly hard. You know, show, show me what the system is doing. Show what, everything? Um, if you've ever had an application where you wanted to log stuff, and so you start to put, inserting, um, I won't say you would do something so crass as just put raise uh, statements throughout your code. But say you start putting log statements throughout your code. That's, I, I think that's like um, cache expiration, right? It's a fundamentally difficult problem in computer science to figure out how to uh, go into any given point cleanly, observe, and then manage uh, your observation points. Uh, Erlang actually has um, tracing, which uh, does this very well. But I don't think that would translate to Ruby. So the distributed system, just to take um, one that I'm familiar with, uh, for example, I'm going to talk about React. So again, it, React is, has kind of that cloudy feel to it. For those of you who aren't familiar, um, you could think of uh, nodes in a React cluster as peers. We'll say they're people. So if these people are in a cluster, I can go to him and say, what's the color of his shirt? And he'll ask and give me the answer. And if I say, what's the color of your shirt, he'll tell me the answer quicker, right? But they all talk to each other. None of them are special. You're all special, but none of them are more important than others. <laughs> there's there's uh, no master-slave configuration. So the system scales horizontally really well. Has a lot of other um, nice properties that fall out of that. But how do you study it? Right, that's the problem. How do we visualize this? So just as a very simple-ish um, distributed system, let's study it. So on this laptop, I have uh, seven nodes running in a React cluster. Just to prove it, here's um, Bash. So there's my th the directory I'm in. I'm in uh, Cascadia Ruby Dev. Uh, dev one through seven, all seven of those are individual nodes running their own airline VMs. And then for all seven of those, I just run a, a ping and I get seven pongs back. I'm going to show you. Um, uh, it, with React, we like to break stuff, so we do live demos all the time. But uh, last time I did a live demo, they said it was a little too exciting, so I'm just going to tone it down a little bit and uh, use screenshots and video. But this, all of this is running on my laptop, so if anybody wants to see me um, break stuff better uh, later, uh, by all means, bother me. So here's a view of the cluster. So it just says that all seven of those players are, are in, the in the cluster. So how do we study this? First way to do it, probably the easiest way, is to benchmark it. So we have this tool called Basho Bench, which is really cool. Basically what it does is it spawns uh, a number of workers and has them go hit stuff. So um, I won't give you any, any, I don't want to give you any ideas of what nefarious things could be done with this, but Erlang is very good at opening up lots of processes simultaneously. Not operating system level processes, processes, Erlang processes that live in the Erlang VM. So I could, I could open 100,000 processes on this laptop, not a big deal. Each one of those has isolated memory, isolated state. So uh, with Basho Bench, we can open up a bunch of workers in their own process that just go hit something. In this case, uh, hit React, insert a piece of data, get a piece of data. We have drivers for um, Cassandra, Mongo, Redis, all sorts of other stuff. So it's a great way to threshold test a system, just pound the crap out of it with traffic and see where it stalls or if you can break it. 
Uh, here's an example a configuration file. Not too much going on here. Uh, the first line I'm putting in mode max. So I'm just saying, you know, open as many connections or, uh, with, with uh, seven concurrent workers. Open connections as fast as you can. As soon as you get a response, go ahead and send a, another request. Okay. So Basho Bench, running on this laptop, produced this graph. You don't really need to, to uh, I won't go through the whole thing. The top one, the top line is th uh, throughput. So every uh, few seconds, it put a dot on the, on the graph, um, and this ran for two hours. So right there, uh, about a half an hour in, I killed one of the, the nodes in the cluster. Just kill nine, just took it out. And so traffic, the throughput came down and then it found a new steady state. So that's pretty interesting. So this is a, an, an interesting way of uh, visualizing the performance of this distributed system, kind of, sort of. Here's another example um, taken from IOSTAT. We put it in nice graph form, so um, it, it, this is the same exact test run. You can see something interesting happens there. That's when I kill the node. And this is hard disk I.O., hard disk I.O. spikes. So that gives us some kind of visualization of how this distributed system performs. But it's not particularly great. Uh, first of all, these, this runs after the fact, right? So in a benchmark situation, you get the, the visual, uh, the, the report after the fact. This wasn't real time. But it's also benchmarking. Don't run benchmarks on a production system. Which brings us to the other options, monitoring. We have people from New Relic here, right? Yeah, New Relic is awesome. They will pry that out of my cold hand, no. Uh, so New Relic is great, um, and it gives you uh, a, a view into the system as it's running. Very, very useful. Um, I'm going to mention a, a, another program that does something similar. Graphite uh, gives you kind of this real-time view of the system performance. Uh, I'm not going to compare the two products at all, but just they're out there, so you can you can get this introspection into a running uh, system. Problem is these these aren't really uh, the problem for me is that these aren't really geared particularly s towards distributed systems. These give you good insight. Uh, in the case of New Relic, excellent insight into a running instance of Rails. If, if it were around when I had the previous problem, it would have been great to uh, look at the performance of the database and uh, the different components of the application in real time. But I want a better feel, a visceral feel of the distributed system. So there's this thing called GL tail. And what this essentially does is it looks at a tail file, or tail's a log file rather, and it looks for specific things, and it represents those uh, things, say, uh, requests to a website as uh, spheres. So uh, I apologize for the darkness up here, but um, I have no control over the background. Uh, so here you can see uh, this example is requests coming into some other website. It wasn't mine. This is not hitting React. but uh, so you can see, I think the bigger uh, uh, circles are bigger file downloads. So a bunch of stuff is happening, and it's, it's very pretty. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Maybe a queue is backing up, and then it gets flushed. So I like that it gives you a sense of things changing through time, and if you get really good at understanding this and comparing it to what's actually happening on your server, this might give you an idea of something. <laughs> Which brings me to UbiGraph. Um, quick poll, hands, anybody heard of UbiGraph? Okay, I didn't think so. I thought, so, Two weeks ago, uh, a gentleman named Creston, who's big, he's a big name in the airline world, posted a video using UbiGraph. And I thought, oh my god, how have I not heard of this before? Uh, so essentially what UbiGraph does is something similar, but it 3D render, renders um, spheres in a relationship. Uh, what Creston did was he hooked that up to 
uh, looking at the processes running in Erlang VM. So again, before I said it's trivial for Erlang to start, start a lot of processes. So it does this in, in uh, supervisor trees, hierarchies, more or less. And uh, if, if you want um, to perform some work, you just spawn a process. It does it in its own little memory state. And when the work's done, you just kill it. It becomes, very, uh, it becomes trivial to manage memory that way. Um, you can, if, if, <laughs> if you want to be overly academic about it, you could think of the processes as almost being little uh, objects, stateless objects, but little objects that talk to each other through message passing. And then um, some, you know, when, an ob when you don't need an object anymore, you just remove it from memory. So what I'm going to show you is a, a video, again, uh, that I did here, where I start UbiGraph, which is just a, a black screen. And um, uh, hopefully it'll show up uh, reasonably well. And then I start uh, this process running in Erlang, where it looks at all of the other processes and their relationship to each other and constructs what React looks like. So this is um, UbiGraph, and there is React. So I'm going to turn labels off here so that's easier to see. You can add the, those labels are actually all the different process names. Right? This is the process tree. Uh, it's really hard to see, but um, you'll be able to follow along enough. So this is the process tree, and uh, the, those green spheres towards the front here, those are processes that connect to external ports. So in uh, React, we can use JavaScript to run MapReduce functions. So these connect to uh, JavaScript VMs. And um, again, it's, it's, uh, it, it's just another way of visualizing uh, something happening. Zoom in here so that it's a little bit easier to see, hopefully. And um, so what happens is when I, I can actually submit a, a request to React, and you can actually see a web machine, which is uh, an airline process that handles the, the request coming in, will create new processes to handle that request as it comes in, saves the data somewhere, and then just kills the request. So here in a in a second, it's going to start um, heartbeat creating uh, processes. So even on um, a running system, even on e even if this were even if this were easier to see, um, it's difficult to see the uh, processes coming into existence and being removed because it's happening too fast. So somewhere in the center, you can see it's kind of twitching. Those are requests coming in, saving the disk, and then dying. The process is dying. So it's, it's mildly interesting. But um, that's just one request coming in. So what does React look like under pressure? So here's the same thing. Uh, React comes into existence. Let there be light. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there is a way to dim this light back here. This software, UbiGraph, unfortunately it's alpha, and I have no way of changing the background color. Yeah, that's, that's definitely worse. Um, so it doesn't, uh, it's not too important, but you can see there's stuff twitching again in the lower uh, uh, right hand corner. And so now Basho Bench is running, just beating the crap out of React. And so processes are just really quick being created and dying down there. 
again, it's kind of cool, but it's not, it's not too interesting. It's just, it's, it doesn't tell you anything. But I like the tool. Um, so I thought, well, how, how do I, Ruby's a great glue language. How do I use Ruby to do something cool with uh, UbiGraph? So there's seven nodes, seven circles. Those nodes represent the nodes of my cluster. Turns out it's super easy to write stuff to, uh, to create your own 3D model in UbiGraph. So that's what I did. I did it in a rake task. Um, here's the first part. It's, it's kind of, um, you don't have to, I oh, can't see the laser pointer either. You don't have to, um, uh, read through this or grok this, but just know, you know, the first line of code, XML RPC, not our favorite, but that's what it uses, who cares, uh, creates a client, and um, then seven times it calls to create a, a new vertex. Really short, really small piece of, uh, of uh, ugly code, but it does what it needs to. But that just creates the cluster. So now, how do we see that under load? So same thing, I create the cluster, right? I'll zoom in a little bit. Too close, okay. So they're all gray. I apologize to anybody who's colorblind, but. Um, and then what I do is I start throwing traffic at it. And the brighter aqua they are, the faster they're serving requests. Right? So you can kind of see them, them blinking on and off, uh, in and out here. It's under high traffic, so everything is, is kind of evenly balanced. I, if I modulated the traffic, it might be easier to see um, which nodes are performing better than others, which would be a sign of like sickness. Right? Node sickness, our computers get sick. And uh, just looking at it, I, I can tell um, other things. If I had a... Uh, if I had this up on, on a monitor, uh, you know, over my desk, and I saw something like that happen, I would know that one of the nodes just died. So what I did was I, again, I just went back and kill nine one of the nodes. So visually, this gives me a, a better experience of fundamentally understanding, in this case, a very small distributed system. And I think that's, uh, that's pretty useful. I restarted the React node. And um, just to prove that I actually did it, there's some Ruby code uh, showing stuff. It basically goes into a, a loop, and for a certain amount of time, it just hits the server and changes the colors of those uh, nodes. So next steps. Bigger systems, right, bigger distributed systems, hooks into specific services, different data services, different uh, web application services. Uh, zero MQ fun, because that is fun. Um, wait, there was a point here. Yeah, so the point is, so computology. So this is the practice of exploring and uh, constructing inductive theories uh, from, from observations that you make in the field. And Again, the, the point for me is that um, these visual systems, it, visualization is a fundamentally different way of understanding what you're working with. So if we can move towards better ways of visualizing the systems that we're working with, I think we're going to understand our distributed systems and uh, see problems in a much more coherent way. So I will continue to be uh, exploring the visceral models of system simulation. Uh, acknowledgements, I thank everybody who made all the software that I relied on, uh, and Shane and Ben for arranging this, and this is uh, still me. Uh, do I have any time for questions? No time for questions. Thanks, guys.